I remember having one of my greatest artistic discoveries, my one of the biggest epiphanies um, in my journey for artistic growth back when I was in uh, college, in art history class, a place that I didn't expect to have such a discovery, uh, namely because my high school experience of the word history was quite boring, <laughs> something I did not enjoy whatsoever. But I remember being in art history class uh, and my teacher talking about the evolution of the color wheel and how often it changed. And I remember when she started talking about the Impressionists and talking about um, how they started to implement temperature into light and shadow. Up until that point, most artists had applied light and shadow more in terms of a value shift, such as lighter red, darker red, lighter blue, darker blue, that type of idea. But when it came to the Impressionists, they started applying things like warmth into the light and cool into the shadows, or cool into the shadows and warmth into the light. And up until that point, that wasn't even a concept that my brain had ever even been exposed to. I never even considered temperature shifts in light and shadow. And I remember walking out of that class for the first time and exiting the building, and it was a sunny day outside, and seeing the world through a brand new lens. All of a sudden, this drab, lifeless city of concrete, of grays, of light grays and dark grays, all of a sudden became yellow sidewalks and purplish blue streets and greenish blue shadows under the trees and yellowish warm greens in the tops. And all of a sudden, I started seeing color everywhere. It was absolutely fascinating how up until that point, and I was already in my early 20s at the time, that that concept had never even occurred to me because nobody ever taught me. Nobody, I, I'd never been told that before. It was revolutionary in my brain artistically. And it gave me a reason to love and appreciate something that I'd completely taken for granted up until that point. Now, fast forward to today where I teach art. It is equally rewarding and exciting to me as a teacher not only teaching the principles of art, but more importantly, teaching my students how to see. Teaching them and exposing them to ways of observing the world around them that they never ever thought possible up until that point. No matter where you are in life, there are, thing, there are things you've learned and things you haven't learned. So when you do make these discoveries, they're equally potent and meaningful to anybody at any level. But that raises another fascination of mine, and that's the art of learning itself how the human brain learns, how we ingest information, but most importantly, why it's so damn difficult to learn. Always. Art is never easy to learn. It's never easy to grow. It always requires a lot of effort and it very often comes with a lot of frustration and discouragement. It's an exhausting process, one that sometimes we feel the need to disconnect from for a little while and come back to because we're just a bit overwhelmed with the whole process. We get frustrated with ourselves when we have a clear goal in mind. We know what we want to see. Yet, when our hand picks up that paintbrush and goes to paint, it doesn't work the way you want it to. And that can be a very discouraging feeling. That's what brings us to today, to today's talk, because I wanna talk about, I was actually inspired by a video I saw recently uh, by Veritasium. I absolutely love that channel and I watch it all the time, every time he posts a new video. And the video I'm referencing, which I'll link right here, is the science of thinking. In listening to him describe the science of thinking, I immediately made that connection to the art of learning because this plays a very big role in how we regard learning and why it can often be so very challenging, particularly for us artists. In this video, he talks about two different types of thinking, two different parts of our brain that we need to use in order to learn. In layman's terms, it would be the working brain versus the automatic brain. And he describes through the video the importance of these two different parts of your brain. They both play a very important role in how we function in today's society, how we function as human beings. But the way he describes these two different brains is 
The working brain is the part of the brain that needs to ingest and take on new information. The working brain tasks itself with the challenge of learning new concepts, taking on new bits of information which it had never taken on before, and has to do a lot of heavy lifting. As such, the working brain generally can only take on smaller tasks at a time. He talks about, for instance, the add one situation where you'll start with four numbers like 7012 and then he'll switch and you have to add one to each one of them so it would be 8 1 2 3 this forces me to use the working part of my brain and my brain very quickly gets tired from this activity whereas the automatic brain has trained and repeated this action so many times that it becomes well automatic hence the word automatic thinking if we do this often enough, it becomes what's known as muscle memory. Although, as Derek describes, it has nothing to do with our muscles, it has to do with our brain. That repeated gesture makes it something familiar to the brain. So instead of it being a series of new complicated tasks that our brain has to take on, which consumes a lot of energy, it becomes a single task that we're very familiar with that requires very little energy, allowing us over time to take on more and more and more of these challenges, or at least take on newer and newer and newer challenges, so to speak. Now, both of these parts of our brain are equally important. This, for instance, is when we're learning how to speak, when we're learning an instrument, when you're learning a C chord for the first time or a G chord for the first time. You have to put your fingers and get them on the right strings and make sure they're between the frets and make sure you have enough pressure and the strings, the metal strings are killing your fingers and you get your fingers and then you strum. Uh, one of the strings buzzing. So you have to adjust that finger and pull it away from the fret a little bit so it's not, it's not buzzing against the fret. And you try again and you try again and you try again. And every single time you do that chord, you have to remember where each finger goes and look back at the sheet music and try to figure it out. But then after you've done it about 50, 60 times and your fingers know where to go, you just go G, D, C, and your fingers just go in the right spot and they strum and you've got the perfect pressure and it's not something you need to think of. Combining enough notes and scales and all of these things, once all of these things start to become automatic to you, you don't have to think about them. And then you can let go of those things and start to just create. Well, exactly that same principle applies to us as artists. One of the things that makes it difficult for us to expand artistically and grow artistically is that we have to learn how to see. We have to learn how to see certain things. When you're drawing, for instance, you're looking at a hand, you draw the hand. How you look at that hand can and will have a profound impact on how you draw it, how you execute it, how believable that hand looks, how you observe the face, how you understand those planes and how the light falls on this face will have a direct impact on how believable that face looks. But in order to capture it properly, you have to see it properly. What makes this so particularly difficult for us artists is that seeing is something that we do constantly. From the moment we wake up to the moment we go to sleep, we are seeing. Even in our dreams, we're seeing with our mind's eye. Seeing is a constant in our lives. Something that you would think the longer you do, the more conditioned we become to do it and the harder that habit becomes to break it. And that's very often why we get frustrated. This is often why we get exhausted and disillusioned when we're trying to draw something, because we put so much effort into drawing what we think we see. The problem is not what you're doing with your hand, the problem is what you're doing with this. Now with any effort, with any effort whatsoever, effort burns energy. It burns calories. So the greater an effort you make, the quicker you exhaust yourself. But referencing Athlean X again, which I've done in earlier videos, the growth of a muscle, the strength of a muscle, and furthermore, the proper development of a muscle has much less to do with how much weight you're lifting and more to do with the technique and how much you're concentrating on those muscles, how much, how aware you are of the anatomy and how that anatomy is supposed to function in order for you to get the best benefit from a movement. Now, if we take that same thought process and we bring that into art, this to me makes me think a lot about speed painting. 
something that I've expressed in the past I'm not a huge fan of, and I'd say to this day I continue not to be a huge fan of speed painting. And the reason for this being is, speed painting, being able to execute a drawing in 45 minutes that looks good enough, is at best a way of showing off your muscle memory. But the problem with this is, the only part of your brain that speed painting requires you to utilize is your automatic brain. Because the very act of growth, the very act of evolution, the very act of creation is an act that requires you to use a lot more of your working brain. The act of creating visual art is a constant challenge on your working brain. You're constantly pushing yourself to see the world through a purer and purer lens. This is something that master artists take extremely seriously. If we think, for instance, about, I believe it's Rembrandt, who discovered much later on in his life that he had cataracts in one of his eyes because of the natural aging of the eye. So he got surgery to correct the cataracts and all of a sudden everything that he saw, he realized was a lot bluer than he thought with his earlier eyes. And as such, interpreted all of his earlier paintings within a certain period as being seen through false eyes. And he destroyed countless works of art as a result of it. As tragic as that is, you can see how, how much importance he placed on how he saw. This was something he put his life's effort into. Facing the reality that what he saw wasn't true was devastating to him, to the point where he destroyed years and years and years of work. Now, I'm not encouraging you to do the same thing, nor do I necessarily feel that he was seeing the world through the wrong eyes. He was just seeing the world through his eyes as it existed at that particular point in time. But it should illustrate the importance of how much effort he put into the act of seeing. This is something that you, artistically, will be challenged with. You have to realize that expanding and becoming something bigger than you already are is an incredibly taxing, physical, emotional activity. Learning art is an exhausting process when you're doing it right. If it's easy, if it's effortless, if, it's from, if you can pull them up, if you can do 10 paintings a week, it's because you're not challenging your brain. You're not challenging your brain to grow. Now, does this mean abandon muscle memory and only paint things you've never painted before? Of course not. In fact, the automatic brain is crucially important when it comes to working professionally. If I look at my friend Tyler Edlin, who produces a, six masterpieces a day, <laughs> forget it, forget me doing that ever. I'm never gonna be able to pull that off. But when he shows me these works that make my jaw hit the floor, his reaction always upsets me. He goes, ah, I did this, it's good, it's going in the right direction, whatever, you know, it's whatever, it's no big deal. And I'm, to me, it's a big deal because he sees the world through a lens that I have yet to experience. He is capable of seeing things that I've never seen before. And contrary-wise, I will execute certain drawings, I'll do certain character illustrations that he has a very strong reaction to. And I look at it and I go, eh, that's okay. I could do better. And he gets frustrated seeing me do that. We're both approaching art from different angles and we're both facing different challenges. We are both in a position, as you are in a position yourself, trying to learn something that your brain has never experienced before. This is something that master artists were expected to do that in modern day society is challenged with this high output mentality when it comes to art. Master artists were expected to lock themselves in the room for weeks and months with complete and utter privacy and as much time as they needed to produce a masterpiece. And the artists themselves, artists themselves were very respected for the time they needed. If you look at Modigliani, he always worked in private. A lot of people speculated it's because he was sleeping with his models, but he was respected for the privacy he needed and nobody ever challenged that. If you look at Leonardo da Vinci, he very often argued with his clients because he took too long. And his response to people trying to rush him was, it's going to take as long as it takes. Take it or leave it. Sometimes he lost a job for it, other people respected him. In the end, what he produced are some of the most memorable, meaningful works of art to date. 
in today's society, when working in a studio, you are expected to produce a high output of drawings. When I was working on the Disney show, the artists were expected to produce unbelievable quantities of work. It was mind blowing how much work, how, how much work they piled on these artists. As such, this left them with zero time that they needed to grow. The only thing they could do to grow was grow at what they were doing. If it was to do backgrounds for Wander Over Yonder, then they got extremely effective at the process of drawing and painting these backgrounds. But that came at the expense of their own personal growth. When working in a studio job, remember that it's important for you to realize that you need to use your autom automatic brain. A lot of what you do in a studio is muscle memory, something you've already practiced and mastered and developed a second nature to before you even walk into the studio. Whereas on your private time, when you're building your portfolio, understand that on your off time, you need to slow that clock down. That being slow, being thoughtful, and always aiming for your best quality is what you need to do to grow. If you're at a point right now where you're accusing yourself of being a quote, slower artist, that's probably because you live a little bit more within the working part of your brain. You're the type of person who, who thrives in a slow, thoughtful, methodical type of growth. But it's important to you as a student, as an aspiring artist, as a professional who's looking for growth to recognize what part of your brain you tend to utilize more? Are you more of a working minded person or more of an automatic minded person? But depending on which one you tend to lean more towards will have a very profound impact on the type of career that you pursue and the type of training you should seek. Furthermore, the type of art that you should aim to produce. I, for instance, live a lot more in the working part of my brain. That comes at the cost of my speed and efficiency. It's for reasons like that, that I thrive in environments that allow me to take my, a little bit more time to produce artwork. You have some serious thinking to do about the type of artist that you are. And instead of trying to pretend to be something you're not, or trying to force yourself to become something you're not, such as a hyper efficient artist or a hyper creative artist, I encourage you to embrace who you are and your particular thought process, your learning process. This will affect the type of jobs that you pick, the type of educators that work best with you, and your overall success artistically. This is not to mean that a person who's highly efficient will never be highly creative. Nor does this mean that somebody who's slower and more creative will learn to be efficient. Both artists have equal potential in the big scheme of things. Both Tyler and I have reached a point in our lives where we are considered professionals at what we do. However, we both came in from two completely opposing angles. We did, however, meet in the middle. By embracing the type of artist that you are and understanding how your mind works, you can cultivate it and find your greatest potential quicker. But the angle we take depends entirely on the type of artist that you are. One of the most important things that I've learned is that no matter how hard I've ever tried, I've never been able to change the core of who I am. I, I've never been able to change the wiring of my brain. The environment that I thrive in today was exactly the same environment that I struggled and felt, felt alienated in earlier on in my career. And it wasn't until I abandoned who I wasn't and embraced who I was and embraced how my mind worked that all of a sudden, I started to cultivate an environment that allowed me to grow at my greatest potential. Thank you very much for joining me on this week's episode of Behind the Scenes. Remember, I put out a new video every single Monday between 8 and 9 a.m. Eastern Time. If you want to know, hit that little notification bell and subscribe so you'll know when I put out new content, as well as my private online art mentorship, Lucid Pixel. You can check it out right here or check the description below as well as the Brush Sauce Theater Art Contest with myself and the famous Tyler Edlin. You can go and check that out as well. With that said, happy learning. I love you all and happy painting.